live. We're nearly there. We're live. All right. All right. Um, I think I picked up your your American. All right. <laughs> I didn't say that. Right. Again, I spent so much time Let's talking do to you. This. <laughs> all right. <laughs> hey, LinkedIn. So come say hello if you join us. Some pop your name. Tell us where you're coming from in the comments below. We'll just wait a minute. Let everyone in. All right. Yeah, well, that, there we go. There, it's coming up. Hey guys, hey everybody. Welcome. Come on in. I think it was a bad choice going grabbing a coffee at five o'clock at night. I think I've already had too many. I, I mean, I thought you were just getting a decaf one. Maybe. <laughs> Living life on the edge, Keenan. Go on, go on. <laughs> You're going to be up till like two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sarah. Hey, Heather. Hey, Sarah. Sarah. Nice to see you. Welcome. Hello, Jen. Come Good away in. Come away in and take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Katie. Hope you're well. Cool. Right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is our ninth session in this series of live streams um, on inspiration and creativity. Um, we're here today to chat with the wonderful Katie Guthrie. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Uh, Katie, for those who don't know, is a mural artist and illustrator has done work for several amazing brands like Urban, Urban Outfitters, Dr. Martins, Grace Hockey, Rome Snowboards, and loads more. Um, before I get started, though, a couple of introductions for those who don't know me. I am Andrew Dobby. I'm the founder of Made Brave. Welcome into our LinkedIn Live home here. Um, Made Brave is a strategic brand agency. If you don't know us and you haven't come across us before, go check us out at madebrave.com. Um, I have to give apologies today, Rachel Brown, who is usually my co-host on this series. Rachel is the CEO of Cultural Enterprise Scotland. Actually, they're not Cultural Enterprise Scotland, they're renamed. Um, they are Creative Entrepreneurs Club, and I always say that. So um, Rachel, unfortunately, can't be here with us today. Um, we wish her a speedy um, recovery. She's not feeling great at the moment, so she will be with us and back on our next session. So hope you get well soon, Rach. Um, we also have Keenan Erwin. Hey, Keenan. Keenan hey. is our brand manager here at Made Brave. Um, so he's going to help and co-host with us today on this session. Um, for those who don't know, this session um, we came about um, uh, at the sort of beginning of COVID. Uh, Rachel from Creative Entrepreneurs Club and Made Brave ourselves, we joined forces as team to see how we could help support the creative industries during what's been a pretty challenging time for us all, I'm sure. Um, uh, we worked with the Creative Entrepreneurs Club. If you check them out, creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk. Um, and we built out, they took their website, which was usually a paid for service. And um, if you um, are looking for help, um, if you're looking for any support, there, you can access some one-to-one -one support over there. So there's all sorts of uh, fantastic people, creatives, um, creative support, operations, finance, all sorts of different expertise. If you want any sort of help, there's free support there. You just need to book a session on the website. I am there if you want to book a session with me. Uh, Keenan is there if you'd like to book a session with her. And yep. Katie, you're also there, aren't you, on the on the platform? Is that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure Rachel, Rachel told me that. But, uh, <laughs> We'll make sure you are on there if we're if we're not already. Um, so yeah, so if you're struggling, if you're you know if if you if you're looking for work at the moment, if you're just trying to figure out your next move, if you've maybe started a business, if you're fresh into freelancing, whatever your challenge is right now, if you want a little bit of help, um, head over there, um, creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk, and we can help you out. Also on LinkedIn, if you go up here somewhere onto your search tab and type in creative industry COVID support group, we have made a. COVID uh, creative industry support group here on LinkedIn. There's about three and a half, four thousand people on there, all helping each other um, and helping each other, pointing in the direction of jobs, um, a bit of moral support, help for grants and loans and etc. So have a look on there if you're looking for that support. 
For now, though, um, obviously this session um, is much about giving us a little bit of inspiration, a bit of creativity just now. So our hope is that these sessions um, will bring um, bring some inspiration to you, to us, hopefully, and um, you know, um, let you sort of, or, or we hope to shine the light on some creatives that you might not have come across as well. Um, so for those who are just joining us, we're going to be doing a quick interview with Katie Guthrie. Katie is a mural artist and illustrator. You can find her on Instagram at, at KMG. Yeah, maybe Keenan, if you, I don't know if you've got that, if you can pop that up on the screen. I do. Um, so Katie is a mural artist, illustrator, who's yeah. done work for loads of amazing brands. She describes her own work as a weird combination of youthful enthusiasm mixed with utter cynicism. Katie's iconic brand, KMG, that I just mentioned, has a distinct street art style that features a wealth of bold and lovable characters, which you will see on her feed, particularly, and my very favourite, a seven-eyed alien called Ken, who is featured throughout Katie's work. Uh, Katie has also collaborated with a number of incredible, incredible street artists and designers, including Hammer Woods, Opanda, and Emma Chapman. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. No worries, no worries, anytime. So how are things with you? Um, they're good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, doing okay at the moment, all things considering. Can't complain, yeah. And, and you're over in Edinburgh, that's right, isn't Edinburgh, it? Edinburgh, yeah. So I stay in Portobello, which is just like a kind of wee seaside town just outside Edinburgh. So it's kind of nice mm. balance being in the centre, but being near the sea as well. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, no, I know it very well. Um, so, well, I suppose to start us off then, would you mind giving us a little bit of an insight into your background specifically i suppose how you got into illustrating illustration sorry and street art yes i guess um my journey is a, a little bit different in some cases to some people i actually studied fine art at grace school of art up in aberdeen that's where i'm mm -hmm. from i actually studied painting um and uh so i actually stayed around in aberdeen after graduating i kind of knew that i just wanted to make art in some shape or form so I wanted to get a job that allowed me as much time to do that because as you'll all know, like graduating with a fine arts degree, it's not the most vocational. Um, so I got a job in uh, my local snowboard shop because snowboarding uh, is kind of the next passion of my life next to making art. And um, just through working in the shop, I guess, I was making my own kind of illustration work. I always kind of did illustration work from a young age. Um, but there was no illustration degrees really. They weren't that popular when I went to art school in 2002, I think. Um, if I want to study like a decent illustration degree, I'd have to go down south to Falmouth, which was um, really cool. But I graduated quite young at 17. A lot of English universities don't take on kids that young. Um, so I just kind of went into painting mm. instead. Um, anyway, so I kind of was putting my illustration work kind of out there on Instagram and stuff. And a few of those kind of snowboard reps were picking up on this. And mm. uh, through that, I just kind of got more and more opportunities to do some snowboards, to do some posters for kind of snowboard or skateboard events, um, you know, do stuff for snowboard publications and magazines. And it just kind of snowballed from there, really, um, to the point where um, it's not actually till I had my son. So I had my son six years ago that I took enough time off to kind of, well, it's supposed to be maternity leave, but I actually just did the turn out more work than ever before. And through that, I kind of got enough opportunities to go full time as an artist. Um, so yeah, it just kind of was a kind of natural progression for me. I can't say there was any sort of, there were some calculated moves in the sense of that I got a job that enabled me to make work. And I guess those opportunities came through the snowboard industry. So that's very much a sense of who you know. Um, yeah. but it was just really simply a case of making as much work as possible and putting it out there. Um, and then murals and street art had always been kind of a passion of mine from a young age. Again, growing up in that snowboard, skateboard kind of culture, you're kind of exposed to hip hop and graffiti at a young age. Um, so I just kind of went out there and kind of did bits and bobs. Um, but it wasn't until I got an internship with Rico, who if, if you, a lot of you from Glasgow, you'll probably have heard of their name. Mm -hmm. They're an art specialist. They kind of took me under their wing with an internship and taught me kind of all I kind of know now about making big work and how to make kind of larger scale murals. And from there, mm -hmm. I just just keep on painting, keep on making as much work as possible. And um, so that's kind of my kind of journey, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, just, uh, you know, probably making that jump between a canvas and then an entire wall. I'm sure that's a 
it's a completely different process and I don't, I don't know how to work that out and I must spend quite a bit to yeah. I think it's definitely the way your brain works. I, I'm often having this discussion recently because I'm noticing a lot more people wanting to crack into murals. And you see a lot of people that just think it's a case of if they can design it on a computer, they can put it on a wall. Um, but uh -huh. It's a completely different process. I mean, I actually prefer working bigger than smaller. So I feel much more comfortable uh -huh. up a ladder on a, on a cherry picker painting on a wall <laughs> than I do. Right. I mean, but that's just how uh -huh. my mind and I honestly think that you can train yourself but I honestly think it's also you know you get people that are animators like I can't get my head around how you can spend hours in animation I think it's the same with with painting in different scales or creating work at different scales too I think some people it's just that's how their brain works because even at art school the kind of paintings I were working I was working on you know six foot by six foot so still mm. for gallery size kind of well then in the kind of the early thousands, that was quite large scale even for that. So I think it's definitely a way that your your brain processes and creates work. Yeah. Yeah, and and when you're creating these murals, then you know what, what's your creative process? Um. So sometimes it's just a case of turning up and responding directly to the landscape and space. Like if I'm doing like stuff on the street, um, I'll often just you know on the day turn up. Sometimes I'll have like a rough sketch of what I'm doing and sometimes I'll just do it when I'm there because I, I kind of believe it's really important to take into the consideration the landscape, um, you know, around you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really like just taking stuff and plonking it in an environment. I think you yeah. really need to kind of bear in mind the topography and the community and take that all into account. Mm -hmm. so sometimes there'll be a case of turning up and, and painting something. And sometimes, you know, if it's, you know, a, a much kind of, a, a, a mural perhaps is going to take me four or five days it's commission i'll definitely go through the process of researching kind of the area coming up with connections that can then be put into the mural so that again it's connected to its surrounding space and it's it's creating a sense of ownership around that space in the community and um, so you know go through a lot of sketching you know figure out the scale and um, i don't use graphs or grids and um, mm. again my brain doesn't work like that you'll see a lot of Mural artists are great yeah. their work. I kind of do it by eye. Um, but oh. for me, having like a sketch in my hand is kind of the best way. So, to so work. Do, you, do you always do them by hand first, and or, or are you doing them in Illustrator, or and then you know off? Um, like it's generally either like literally just like a pen in my sketchbook or a pencil in my sketchbook. Like I like for all like um, you'll see the piece probably I did most recently. I did that yesterday. The type the kind of Tiger King one. Um, I just kind of sketched that in pencil, so I didn't even know what colours I was going to do it in. And I just kind of turn up and generally colours <laughs> I've got enough of <laughs> in the studio that dictate what 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 colours you know. Uh -huh. um, but generally, just like a black and white sketch. Again, if it's going to be like a piece that's been commissioned, I'll I'll normally do it in Procreate. Um, I'm not the most technologically advanced when it comes to kind of using the pen tool or whatever in Illustrator. So I generally just draw it and procreate. And then if it has to become a vector, bring it into Illustrator and do the, the dreaded life trace. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I suppose like if I was, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm a, an artist, a designer, and I'm thinking, I want to do my first mural, right? How, how do you get a wall? Who's, who, who gives you a wall? How did you get your first wall? How do you persuade someone to let you paint on it? Or um, So walls are kind of, notoriously hard to come by I and mean, it's becoming a bit easier now there's more legal walls um around in each cities um i don't think glasgow's got a legal wall but there's definitely spots in glasgow you can paint where you know people turn a blind eye to it uh, edinburgh's mm -hmm. got like, a couple legal spots now aberdeen's got i think three legal spots dundee's got like a, mm -hmm. a two or three legal spots there are areas that you can turn up and I'd always say, like, you know, if you want to get into street art, like, I started just painting illegally, and it's just a case of finding a spot that's a bit shady that you're not going to get caught. Uh, I wanted to know. I wanted to know the real truth there. I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to know how do you, how do you just go at night, or what, like, how do you, what, what, you know, how do you do it? Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, if you're doing it illegally, it's just a case of finding, you should always scope your spot out before you hit it, just so you kind of go, you know, the, the footfall, if there's any cameras, you know, you don't want to get surprises, escape routes, etc. But um, if you're kind of wanting to not take the legal route, I mean, go to a legal wall and you can practice painting big. 
Um, I would recommend that. I mean, I actually just, I think my first wall was a pub in Aberdeen that asked me and my friend Mike if we would paint on a mural for them inside. So that was pretty cool, just in a bar that wasn't open yet. Mm. Um, and then I think when people notice you do more work and you put your work out there, then more people are like, well, I want you to paint my wall. Um, uh -huh. I want wall, you know, um, or now, I mean, street art's big business now. You've got people putting out tenders for walls and people asking for artists to submit, you know, artwork for walls. So going on Creative Scotland, I mean, you'll often see on Creative Scotland there's a public commission, like, in a, in, in a city where they're looking for artists to create a mural in a, in a wall. But I would recommend, I mean, although I've just said that I took on a few mural jobs without having any experience, I would recommend maybe at least trying it first somewhere because spray paint's not easy to do you know it's not mm, easy yeah to work with it's uh you don't have to use spray paint though you can use masonry paint but again going back to that um i think you've seen, you know you, you can always tell somebody's got experience painting big generally um so it's good to kind of try and get a bit of experience behind you because it is can be quite daunting painting mm -hmm. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, I mean, we've all been there. I've taken on so many jobs. I've just said yes yeah, to a job and learned on my feet. I think a lot of people do that in the creative industry. You don't, you don't want to turn down works. So you say yeah, and then you just figure it out <laughs> as as you're doing it. Uh, right. Definitely. So an element of that too. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just laughing at this guy. I love that. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> So did you were saying earlier that you don't do animations or uh, but um, is this did you do this one though? This is about the height of I have like over lockdown. That's actually one of the first animations I've ever done. But um, <laughs> over lockdown, I tried to like push myself to learn animation. But I it's all like frame by frame because I go and I go in the After Effects and first of all it takes about ten minutes to load and then yeah. <laughs> by that point I'm bored. And then, right. <laughs> Or I go into Skillshare, I'm trying to learn, like, I do really want to properly learn animation, but it just, I think you really need to, to have a brain that can figure out, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I have that kind of way of thinking. If you, like, Katie, see if you think it takes a long time to, to, to load After Effects. See, when I started, right, so I'm 39, when I was about 18 or 19, and I used to, I used to have a PC, and <laughs> I used to do something like Photoshop, and if I wanted to then take that file and do something in like Flash or or like Premiere or something, the machine was so small, so slow and had so little memory. I had to uninstall, I had to uninstall Photoshop, I had to reinstall the other package and then restart the machine, do something, then do the whole process again to go back to the other program. So if you did something wrong, like it was <laughs> this, yeah. this was a whole day wasted. It's a whole day, yeah. So because <laughs> well, when you're painting, you're just painting, you know. <laughs> like, you, have, you yeah, need to start animation though. If this if this is the bar you've set with animation, this is you need to continue. Uh, yeah, yeah like, I do. I'm, I'm kind of. I did have fun, but it's just. Um, God, yeah. Like I don't know how people do like feature length films. You know what I mean? Like gifts mm. are kind of manageable, but <laughs> yeah. Like, God, it's, I think I, I worry about like, like are, they, are they mentally okay? Like, can you, can you <laughs> it? it seems odd to me, but I, I just love animation. I do love it, but I do need to try. It's well, definitely up there. I was up there on my lockdown kind of new skill set in case nobody wanted any of paint murals anymore. I had to learn a new skill. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I suppose in that respect, then how how has your work changed during COVID? You know, like obviously, you know, a lot of your work had been larger walls. Is that still happening? Is there more of it, less of it? Are you you're know, you having to do other things to kind of make a living? Yeah, I mean, the, the mural work definitely dried up because nobody could leave their house, and um, <laughs> you know, like the, nobody had any money. And the last thing they want to spend their money on, as we know, is generally the creative industries um, and again a lot of a lot of my clients tend to be in the hospitality sector and um, so you know that was suddenly gone but I, you know murals are only kind of part of or part of what I do I do a lot of commercial illustration too so I'm lucky enough to get a couple of jobs like I did a beer can with, with the guys at Pim Pam that was one of the first jobs actually in lockdown mm -hmm. I got so grateful for that and um, but then I actually because like a lot of work had dried up, I actually was making a lot more of my own personal work. 
And I didn't think anybody would be buying artwork because, you know, there, nobody knew what was going on. It was a pretty scary mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. also felt really crass to be pushing your own work when there's this pandemic killing people and, and making people really ill. It felt a bit kind of tasteless to be like, oh, hey, do you want to buy this print? But, um, you know, that realistically was a massive lifeline for me. Um, mm -hmm. The first three months was just I was so grateful to all those people that, that were buying artwork or buying T-shirts or it, it totally blew me away. It made me like, yeah, so that really kind of was a big lifesaver for me. And, and at the moment, you know, this, the, the the shop sales are a bit slower, but that's kind of because I've not really put anything up in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to be looking to do that again over winter because I think, you know, I've just got this feeling in my bones that the winter season is going to be a slow one perhaps again um, yeah I, and I, I, I know specifically there's someone listening here um, who's started a clothing brand recently. Um, have you any tips for kind of you know how to drive those sales? How to you know are, are you you know are you outsourcing all the production of that stuff? Have you any 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 things you've learned for you know people that are sort of doing that who have been creatives and are maybe needing another way to earn cash right now? You know? um, yeah, I mean, I used I actually used some friends down south. Um, my printers um, I totally forgot their name off the press um so i really like using them because they um they're a sustainable print kind of workshop mm -hmm. so like uh, all the t-shirts i use are made from old recycled plastic bottles i was kind of really nice. conscious yeah. of that kind of aspect as well because sustainability is obviously you know something we all need to bear in mind these days and fast fashion yeah. you know for a lot of bad things in the world so for me that was kind of something i kind of was i wasn't sure if people would pay the extra money because obviously it does put your prices up slightly and yeah. um, my experience people are quite happy to pay a bit more as long as they know it's sustainable and you can justify it but in terms of marketing yeah you just need to push it for me instagram is my biggest tool and mm -hmm. um, the majority of my work comes from instagram so sometimes you just have to be shameless with those hashtags you know it's embarrassing but if it pays the bills at the end of the day yeah you know, there's no shame in it and um, pushing your work also you don't have to be overkill i think people get kind of a bit fed up if you're constantly shouting about your product um, mm -hmm. and you know put it out there and then i find like people are so good at sharing like so if they buy a t-shirt they'll take a photo of themselves and share it and then you mm -hmm. can share it and i think there's a real community of people that support artists um, you know they're quite happy to kind of be your champion which is yeah. so, so where can people buy your stuff they can buy it via my website <laughs> kmgye.com slash oh, there we go yep. <laughs> there you yeah. go there, there right we there. go got to get them yep. sales that's it <laughs> <Favorite> <laughs> <sales>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just a reminder for everyone really quick, uh, everybody's watching, if you have any questions, just as we're going along, uh, you want Katie to expand on something, or you just want to take the conversation in a different direction, that's totally fine too. Uh, just put your, your question in the comments there, um, and we'll, we'll uh, try to get to it. Um, so Katie, I wonder, um, you know, so you've, how long have you been, how long have you been doing murals for? Um, so about 10 years, I think it is now. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, like, obviously they weren't, um, uh, they weren't all massive at the start. They kind of started off small and were getting progressively bigger. Um, <laughs> right. My big, my big goal is to kind of get a gable end kind of thing within the next year or so. That's my kind of main mission. I really want to do a ginormous Ken, like a massive Ken. I want oh, you to do that amazing. as well. Like a multi-story, <laughs> yeah. like multi-story one. Yeah. Yeah, like just kind of. I don't know if I'm a big fan of stick. I don't know if you've heard of the street artist stick. Um, no. Time I go down to Shoreditch, he's got these. He does these kind of well, like they're stick characters essentially, and uh, he's got mm. these two giant stick on the end of this building um, in Shoreditch, and I just think, oh, that's awesome. Um, oh, I do um, know it. Yeah, I recognise. I've just googled it, and yeah. Yeah, you'll know it if you see, especially if you've been to London, stick stuff's like everywhere. Um, what was the question again? I totally forgot. Uh, well, no, I, was just, I was just trying to get a sense for how long. I mean, has it, do you feel like, um, has the scene changed quite a bit since you started? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, you know, like I said, I grew up in Aberdeen um, and 
Aberdeen to me is kind of in a, in some ways unrecognizable now to what it was like when I was like a little, like rascal running around with a spray can. It was mm. uh, street art was like you know and graffiti was heavily heavily frowned upon like. Mm -hmm. I think what John told me, I would say the statistics, it blows my mind, but like uh, Aberdeen's got more cameras, so like street cameras per population in another city in Europe apart from London, which well, is kind of bad when you think about it. And that's just because of the private sector, the oil runs Aberdeen, so money talks. Mm -hmm. So there's cameras mm -hmm. everywhere. So if you try to get up to mischief in that city, it's incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, so when we were kind of going around doing our like my kind of I used to make these like anti-fascist stickers and uh, like um, these like wee jellyfish stencils. That was kind of my first <laughs> introduction to, to street art. Uh, right. Spraying these wee jellyfish stencils down dark alleyways and breaking into old mills and doing them in the walls in there. You know, uh, it was a totally different kind of scene. Um, and you, and you weren't putting it out there. You weren't putting it on Instagram. Instagram didn't exist. Camera. Yeah. Phone this you know in some ways which is good because it means there's no evidence there to <laughs> <laughs> right. um, right. that's maybe know. another tip is if you do it illegally don't take a picture of it well I, mean, I, have, I have discussions with pals about this because you tend to find a lot of kind of street artists who put their stuff on instagram they're kind of be private or they won't you know have right. anywhere on their photos but um but yeah, but Aberdeen now, like uh, just Aberdeen is a city in terms of, I think Scotland's kind of the same. They've really embraced street art and graffiti. Street art probably more than graffiti, um, you know, because people like to know what they're looking at. A lot of people don't like graffiti because they don't understand it, which I think is a real shame. I think, you know, some, sometimes I see some graph artists and I think their work blows a lot of street artists' work out of the water. I think te technically it's mind-blowing um, but like in terms of street art people are much more kind of relaxed about it you can paint on the street like now with just wearing a high vest pretending you got to be there you probably <laughs> walk away with that kind of you know, 10 20 years ago probably somebody would have pulled you up being like what are you painting whereas now people just assume that you're supposed to be there and you know what you do and um, right. so i just think and just the art as a general i mean it's a recognized art movement now that's really recent it's become uh -huh. a recognized art movement you know, I think, you know, people like Banksy, Shepard Fairey, they're really kind of at the forefront in that getting artwork in the gallery. Again, you can sit here talking about the pros and cons of that till the cows come home. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, it has changed drastically. Um, some, in some ways, for the, for the good, in some ways, not so much. Um, yeah. When anything becomes more popular, it becomes more commercial. Um, you know, there's big discussions at the moment about the use of street art and gentrification, pushing kind of people out of communities. Um, so there is a really interesting discourse there, uh, mm. but it's continuing continuing to evolve. Uh, and for people like me who can make a living out of it, you know, it's a good thing. Um, but I think there still needs to be, for me, my ethics and morals still play a big part in, you know, what I do, who I do work for. And what I choose, mm -hmm. um, I think you know. But that's up to each individual artist and their own integrity, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a couple of questions come in. Um, Mr. Ben Nielsen um, has asked. Oh, I've just sorry. You, I clicked it. You clicked <laughs> it. I think at the same time. So, what was the project you did for Rome snowboards? Ben's uh, a huge snowboard fan and is kitted out with all the Rome gear. Oh, cool. That's good to see. Ro I love Rome snowboards. They're so good. And I'll just say that because I've done work for them. Like, I worked in the snowboard <laughs> for years and I was always hyping up Rome's because people just overlooked them. I can actually show you. I did a snowboard. I've got it, I've got it over here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Like a uh, oh, hey, for a second. Me, yeah, so, like, let me reduce this. There we go. Uh, did snowboard called a label I did a few years ago. Uh, I've actually got another sneaky thing coming out with Rome. I'm not really allowed to talk about it yet, but there'll be something coming out in the not too distant cool. future. Um, I don't know if it's. I don't think it's going to be out in next seasons because the. I don't think it'll be out in the next seasons line, but it might be out in the 2022 line. Uh, but I, you know, Rome snowboards are great, great guys, great guys to work for, great snowboards. So yeah, good, good job. Fantastic. Good job. <laughs> 
We've got one other question here from Matt Sinclair. Yo, Katie, do you think that Edinburgh will ever be more open to having murals around? And do you think it benefits the city? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think, you know, we, me and my pals here often discuss this because Edinburgh, it's got its golden goose with the, the festival and tourism. But I think, you know, COVID has perhaps been a rude awakening for the council that they cannot just depend on tourism. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's similar to Aberdeen last night. Mm -hmm. Aberdeen really didn't diversify out from oil because they were like, why do we have to? Until the oil crash. And all of a sudden, you see this sudden investment in the creative industries. Um, with new art, with painted doors, you know, and I think Edinburgh is starting to pick up on that. Um, I think I, I I do know there is discussions at the moment with people um, in Edinburgh. Um, there's a couple of people talking about getting some more murals on the go. It is sounding positive. I don't think it's going to be like, you know, it's going to be a progressive kind of route. Um, I think you've got to dip their toes in the water and then how people respond and then go from there but I think it is looking more positive um, and it's a difficult city because there's so many listed buildings as well um, if you're from Edinburgh you'll, you're probably like me you'll walk around and see so many potential rendered walls that would be perfect so I, I hope so I don't I, you know as I say there are talks about it so fingers crossed it'll happen and it will benefit the city I mean we'll see yeah. I mean Look at Berlin, Barcelona, like any city, Malaga, you've seen the positive impact yeah. we are on the economy and tourism footfall, things like that. Um, again, we go into that discussion of gentrification, with the, the pros and cons there. But if you're trying to sell murals to a city, there's definitely an economical argument there definitely, that yeah. does create money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, ben says thanks. <laughs> I'll no put worries, this back yeah. out there. There we go. See you up the hill, Ben. All right. Um, I suppose then, is there any, do you have any heroes? Do you have any anyone that you follow that you have for go to for inspiration? Or does your inspiration come from elsewhere? You know, I suppose it's interesting to see where I that guess My heroes are just kind of, I kind of predictable, like Keith Haring, one of my biggest heroes. In, in almost every sense of his practice and how he manages to straddle the kind of commercial personal practice kind of, you know, he created a brand, but he still creates some, you know, he just wasn't this commercial brand. He was so much more than that. And he created so many great pieces on the street. His art was phenomenal. He fought for so many good political causes and things that he believed in. And so as an artist, Keith Haring to me is, you know, probably the biggest inspiration. Basquiat's another one. And um, kind of from a street art perspective, Flem, I don't know, if, like P-H-L-E-G-M is a English street artist who does these fantastic kind of character driven murals. Uh, One Up is a kind of graffiti crew over in Berlin. Mm -hmm. They're really pushing kind of like, like they're working to another dimension. And like they did this piece in a, like a half sunken cruise ship and they're really pushing kind of politically, they're pushing, you know, on the acceptance of migrants and refugees. They're pushing their work like into some amazing directions. Sick boy, God, too many. Um, an artist I really like at the moment is actually a French graffiti artist called Soft Rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's just doing some great, great work. Yes, that's Flem stuff, the stuff's like, Wow. Yeah, and it's really cool. Um, and he's such a lovely guy. I actually got to meet him. He painted a mural in Aberdeen for, for New Art. And uh, my friend John, who, who works, knows that I like totally love Flem. So he uh, he kind of said, oh, go say hi to him. And I was pure fangirling. It was quite bad. <laughs> he was such a lovely guy, just really humble, which I really like because I hate when you meet your heroes and they're total arseholes. Um, he's just a guy and, like, you know, just super sound, yeah. So I mean, tons, tons, tons of inspiration, yeah. And and um, I suppose um, when you're a younger creative, sometimes you know trying to hone your style can be quite difficult. I remember being younger <laughs> a long time ago. Um, no, I can't. Um, but you know, like when you're trying to, I suppose when you some when sometimes get started in design or creativity or illustration, you're trying a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And I suppose like when you identify all of these 
artists, all these sort of ones that have done really well, and yourself included, people tend to find and hone a sort of style they become known for. Yeah. Um, do you, how, how important do you think that is? And second of all, how do you get there if you've not found your style yet? I think that's a really interesting question because I think, you know, so many people, I, th I think it's really interesting, it's really important to discuss it. Because I remember when I was starting off as a, an illustrator, I like one of my favorite illustrators, Michael Sieben. And my work, because I was just obsessed with him, my work did kind of look a bit like his work. But I wasn't really getting that, you know, it wasn't like I was like doing the same work or getting a job. I just kind of put it on Instagram and I just get like suddenly attacked for ripping him off. And it kind of, did scare me a bit because I was like, oh God, I hadn't even realized, you know, it has, and I kind of pushed myself more to find my own direction. But I think it's totally normal when you're starting out that obviously your inspirations are going to have a massive influence on your work. It's mm -hmm. part of the journey. It's very unusual unless you're like, you are very gifted that you're going to come out straight away with this mind blowing style. Um, and yeah. it, it has to grow, it has to evolve. Um, and I think, you know, what I've learned over the kind of past, you know, well, I've been drawing since I've been two, but like probably over the past 10 years is just like, once you, it's important to take inspiration and educate yourself, go to galleries, read books, find out about artists, but just draw as well. And don't worry about if your stuff looks the same as somebody else's. And, you know, just work on your own style and what you want your artwork to look like. And I think when you start doing that, something just clicks. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and find something and you're like oh shit that works and you push it and push it and push it um but it, it's just a, it's just good old-fashioned hard work unfortunately i don't think there's any quick fix and i think artists will continue to evolve i think a lot of people want you to stay in the same box but that's not normal it's not normal to do that in any frame of work yeah, yeah. I, actually, I actually interviewed Michael Wolf, um, famous designer, and oh, yeah. uh, he, he yeah. talks about it. It's quite nice to look up if you've not come across it, but he talks about the four rooms of creativity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very much like you said, that we all have to start mimicking, you know, because we have to we have to try and, you know, copy and understand and be able to do the craft. And that's not a bad thing, you know, so it's kind of bad that you get slated for, for doing that because it's just part of the process. And I can't remember exactly the four rooms, but basically the way he talks about it, it's four rooms of a house and eventually once you've gone through all these pro this process you end up in your own room where you've yeah. where you've crafted it where you can mimic you can do this and you've learned but you've found the bit that's yours you know and i think um i'll try i'll try and link that article pop it in the comments for anyone that's listening yeah i think it's just so important because i think so many people are people can be bastards you know especially <laughs> with social media um, you know, people like, you know, they won't think twice about shitting on your work and try and rip you to shreds and you know, mm -hmm. you, you really have to just not give a fuck and like yeah. mm -hmm. work because you want to make work and um, not because you're doing it to look like some, you know, like don't worry if it does, but don't make work because you feel like it's something you should be doing or, you know, just make the work you want to make because that at the end of the day is what makes you unique. If you're making your own work and doing the stuff you want to do, um, that's what people pick up on. Um, yeah. You know, they, 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 they don't pick up on the people that are just, Kind of playing it safe and you know not trying to push themselves and even if you know be selective I, in some ways i think don't be selective because sometimes like there's nuggets of gold even in the shit like <laughs> that you will recognize but other people will um, and yeah, mm -hmm. just have fun and make work and push it and see where it ends up and if you don't like it fuck it just yeah, and then we, we continuously hear that, you know, we speak to a lot of artists, a lot of designers, and a common theme that comes across is just put your stuff up, you know, and as you say, like, there just might be something to someone that's magical that they see and they say, oh, I want something like that, I want to commission yeah. something like that, and it, you know, so put out what you want to get back is a good tip for creatives, isn't it? I think just continue to do your own stuff, the stuff that you're passionate about, and try and kind of block out that feedback almost, um, or or most of it, or, or part of it anyway, I think. Mm -hmm. well, was it? I remember my lecturer told me in art school, if everyone likes what you're doing, you're doing something wrong. Because you yeah. need to have as much love, like hate as love. Because otherwise, yeah. if no one really hates it, no one really loves it. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think along this uh, along this line of like kind of doing your own work, um, this is another good question uh, here from Kieran Smart. Um, he says, "Awesome work. Recognize it from the green in Aberdeen." Yeah. Uh, do you find that you get creative freedom in commercial projects? Um, some yes and some no. Uh, I think 
it's important to remember when you're getting paid to do a job, it's normally because you're doing something you wouldn't do in your free time. That's why you're getting paid to do it. Um, that's why it's a job. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember when I first did illustration, I used to feel like I had to be a chameleon with my styles to fit the briefs that people wanted. And I used to yearn to get jobs based on my own style, which is kind of what's happening now, which is cool. But now I feel like I'm worried that everything will look the same. <laughs> so I think mm. there's like benefits to both. Um, some some clients are really, yeah, some clients will just be like, yeah, like just do whatever you want, like go for yeah. it. Yeah. Clients, you know, like, you know, you, they'll have more of a brief. Um, you know, some, some jobs you'll find they get signed off instantly. Other jobs, you'll have endless <laughs> amendments. I think, you know, a lot of your creatives, you'll know you've got to fix little bits or do little bits. Or sometimes you've got to draw stuff you really don't want to draw as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you, that's the job. You know, unfortunately, it's not it's not all glamorous. You can't just do what you want to draw all the time. Sometimes you even when you know something's going to look bad, you still have to do it. <laughs> but, you know, that's right. why. <laughs> and just sign your name really small. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Like um, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm quite lucky. I think like almost all my clients, I've like had a really good time with. They've been really sound. I, I'm one of the lucky few. I think that. I've not had to work with too many assholes. Um, and most of the time they're totally on the same wavelength visually as I am. So it's, it's mm -hmm. the experience, yeah. Brilliant. Um, I just had a question I, I was wondering, you know, we, we've often got a lot, a lot of younger creatives um, and especially just now we were talking just before we came on air. Um, there's obviously a lot of people who found theirself um, you know, maybe when they thought they were getting a job or, you know, out of work and, you know, they've been thrown into the world of freelance and they've been thrown into kind of having to fend for themselves. And, and, and I suppose um, you've had a lot of experience now um, doing what you do. And, you know, I suppose if you had any advice for someone who was just starting right now, who was trying to find their feet, who was trying to, again, like I said before, try to find their style and trying to just get started, mm -hmm. what would what would be the best use of their time? Um, I think the first most important thing is don't have an ego. I see so many people mm -hmm. just come out like entitled, like they're all something, that they deserve something because they've gone to uni or they've done some course or they've done this or they've been working X amount of years. I mean, like, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. Like, mm -hmm. you can be the best artist in the world, but if you've got a bad attitude, it's not going to take you anywhere. Um, you know, so be humble, be kind, help each other out. Um, you know, just I, I know it sounds cliche and everybody hates saying it because everybody wants like a fast track kind of magic bean to get where they want to go. But it's like what we said earlier, just make work as much as you can and put it out there and make work you want to make. Because, um, you know, like you'll see a lot of people like go on these creative brief sites, but then they end up just all creating the same work. So uh -huh. like, do work that kind of resonates with you, your interests, your inspirations, or you know, if there's any political or social causes that you care about, use your work to channel that and have use your, your work as a voice that that talks, you know, tells people something about you and has a bit of a personality. Um, and going back to the not having an ego, like um, don't worry if you finish uni, you don't work, walk straight into like a job in a design studio or a art studio or whatever. You know, don't be too ashamed to get a job like in a supermarket or, you know, or you know, in a shop. Mm -hmm. Who cares? As long as you can pay the bills and you can make artwork, or you know, that's all that matters. Um, and if you keep, you know, if you keep on it and you keep making work, opportunities will come knocking. I totally believe that and it seems to be what's happened with the majority of my friends. Um, so, you know, you just need to be stubborn, really stubborn and just work as hard as possible. And be nice to people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great tip there. Great tip. So, yeah, I suppose the, the, the future, Katie, what does the future look like for you from here? Well, what can we expect? Um... Who knows? Survival. Um, just, I, I'm going to make, make more personal work. Like we discussed that earlier, actually. Um, I'm working on some on a new edition print, um, which will be getting released soon. Um, I'm working on a few new projects that I'd like to speak about. I want to do more walls. I think that's it. More big walls. Hopefully that's what the future holds for me. 
Um, but just making as much work as possible, um, having fun, try not to take life too seriously, as difficult as that is right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think we're we're about in 45 minutes, so that's usually about the time we do these sessions. So I just want to take this opportunity to say a big thanks. Um, there's no more questions sitting waiting, Keening, is, is there? No, I think we're no, all no. we're all good. So yeah, Katie, just big thanks to you. Uh, I love your straight talking attitude. Uh, I could listen to you all day. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons why you're successful, and uh, I wish you all the success for the future as well. Thanks to everyone who's taken this time out in the evening to sit and uh, join us. Us. Um, we have these sessions, these ones specifically every two weeks, um, where we're highlighting and bringing in great, inspiring creatives. Um, so if you want to join us, make sure you have notifications turned on for Made Brave on LinkedIn, because we always do them over here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you joined us slightly late, Rachel is not here, our co-host. She will be back um, in the next two weeks um, with us. Um, yeah, and if you want to if you want to check out any of the previous sessions that we have done, you can find them on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club, creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk website. Um, again, where you can find one-to-one -one support with a whole ton of creatives and people who can help you, um, or you can find them on the Made Brave YouTube channel. Just search Made Brave on YouTube. Um, and lastly, if you want to check Katie's work, I think it's running along the bottom underneath yep. me but you can at kmg yet on insta or kmg .com if you want to buy something from our shop and support <laughs> katie do it which would be very nice <laughs> um so yeah thanks and we'll see you all next time take care bye bye thanks guys thanks everyone see bye. ya bye bye